the countless honors and prestigious awards and recognitions received by Albert Bandura through all the world testify the high respect he is held in the scientific community. They acknowledge the groundbreaking contributions of his work across broad areas of psychology as well as across many different disciplines. The value and merits of the person are further attested by his major concern for putting our knowledge at service of human enlightenment and betterment. His theory was well suited to meet the revolutionary advances of communication technologies and to set the conditions to enable individuals and communities to better shape their lives and achieve the changes they desire. The extraordinary accomplishment of Albert Bandura proves how psychology may impact over the entire society and may contribute with a proper theory of human agency and personality functioning to sustain education and personal development, to inspire public policies and to improve people's condition of living even globally. Albert Bandura is listed among the most influential psychologists and among the most influential thinkers of our time. I can say where he is ranked today with regard to Freud, Skinner or Piaget. But we have the privilege to meet the person and the unique opportunity to meet with him the best legacy of our discipline. So thank you for being here and now I let you the words. Well, thank you for this very generous introduction. Um, I grew up in a, um, a tiny town uh, north of Edmonton uh, Mondaire, uh, population 400. And that's where all the cold fr fronts originate. And then we sent them down to the US and, and A. My parents migrated from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, my mother from Ukraine and my father from Poland. Um, they had no formal education. Um, and they were really the homesteading pioneers of the Canadian nation. Uh, my uh, father uh, worked on the railroad. He was laying the track for the Trans-Canada uh, Railroad. And when he got enough money, he purchased a homestead, which consisted of land that's heavily wooded with a lot of boulders. And what you have to do is cut all those trees down, you have to pull out the roots, you have to pull out the boulders, all with you and two horses. It was all manual. And um, in addition, they had to build their roads. He supervised the construction of the roads. They had to build their houses. They had to build their churches and schools. So when one talks about constructionism and psychology, they actually acted it out. Um, uh, my mother um, ran a delivery uh, uh, service. All the goods that came into town came in by, by track, railroad, and so we delivered the supplies, the uh, lumber, the, um, the coal, and all the uh, supplies um, uh, to the store. Um, Mandaire had, uh, had very little in the way of educational resources. Um, grades 1 through 12 were housed in the same school. Um, a couple of teachers tried to teach the whole uh, high school curriculum. 
Um, I had to enroll in a few courses by correspondence. There was one time we pilfered the teacher's trigonometry answer book and brought the <laughs> class to a halt. Now, ordinarily, uh, these conditions would be viewed as a uh, severe educational handicap. Uh, for me, um, it enabled me to um, learn how to take responsibility for my own education, uh, educational development. And um, now, the content of these courses is perishable, but the acquisition of uh, uh, self-directedness has really served me ver very well uh, throughout my uh, whole career. Um, in a way, m my theory, uh, my psychological theory is founded on um, human agency, which means that people have a hand in determining the course their lives take. And in many respects, uh, my theory is really a reflection of my life path. Interesting. And uh, what got you from uh, the little village of Mander to the British uh, Columbia University? That is rather prestigious at that time. Too. Yeah. Well, one day my mother sat me down and she said, Albert, you have to decide what you're going to do with your life. And I said, well, for one thing, I have a hockey game in half an hour. <laughs> She said, no, you don't. <laughs> she said, um, Albert, you can uh, stay here and toil uh, and work on the soil. You can um, play pool and you can drink yourself to oblivion in the beer parlor or you can try to get an education. Now, in her persuasive options, Education seemed like the like the better better options. I packed up and uh, headed off to the University of British Columbia, primarily in search of a more cosmopolitan life and a uh, benign climate. I might add that they placed, although they uh, had no formal education, they placed a very high value on education. When you were in Vancouver, what took you to? psychology, how do you find interest in psychology? What was the major uh, attraction of the discipline? Yeah, well, I, I found my profession uh, as a result of a chance event. Um, I was commuting to the university with a group of pre-meds and engineers, and these guys had classes so early in the morning, I didn't know there was even life that early. And, um, and so I was uh, sitting in the library waiting for my next class, and uh, a student had uh, left a course catalog on the table. And I was sort of just flipping through it, and then it occurred to me, uh, I should try to find a course that will be a filler. And um, I noticed this course in psychology, and I said, that would fit in well as a filler. And what surprised me is how a trivial event can determine the choice of a career. And um, the and it's clear that virtually, or a good deal of our uh, choices, the most important ones are often determined by the most trivial of circumstances. So I I go to my advisor and I uh, I decide I was going to go to graduate school. So I go to my advisor and I say, where are these stone tablets of psychology? And he said at the University of Iowa, uh, and. Um, Iowa was probably the most distinguished uh, university at that time at the, at, the, uh, at the height of behaviorism. And that was a school that was probably the best representation of uh, Hull's, uh, uh, Hull's theory. But then he warned me that it's a very tough place. But basically, you got a scholarship to go there, or uh, no. you have been admitted uh, immediately? Well, I was admitted, but because of uh, uh, the requirement for citizenship, I couldn't qualify for any fellowship or scholarship. But the faculty managed to uh, put things together that kept me supplied with the uh, coin of the realm. So I wrote, I wrote to my um, advisor and said, uh, yes, I was a tough place, but it's also a very supportive one. And it reminded me of, of um, Mark Twain when he said, 
uh, of Wagner's music, it's not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> what was the environment uh, in Iowa? Um, Did you it, like it? Uh, it, it was oriented around a, um, um, the uh, Bayeristic model that was in vogue then. And um, um, they, uh, they, there, were, there were a lot of very interesting faculty there. Probably the most interesting one was uh, Gustav Bergman, who uh, uh, was a uh, philosopher who was providing the philosophical foundations for, uh, for uh, behaviorism. He uh, had a very unique uh, lecturing style. He would walk around the room, chain smoking. He, he had a whole pocket full of wooden matches and he would, you know, light them this way. And uh, he didn't like uh, gestaltism, so one day he's shouting, if the whole is greater than the form of the parts, then the whole's a ghost, and he was hitting him on the thigh, and he started the matches on fire. And the student says, uh, uh, Professor Bergman, you're, you're on fire. And he says, you're Zam right I am, <laughs> thinking he was speaking figuratively, figuratively, yeah. And from Iowa, uh, you got your first job in Stanford. Yes. The situation, the, the environment was quite different. Oh, yes. Iowa and Stanford. Oh, so yes, what, yes. This, this, was, this, this, this was palm trees. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Stanford was, it was really, it's, it's really a fabulous place. You have very bright students. You have a distinguished faculty. You have freedom to, uh, uh, to go wherever your curiosity takes you. And a university ethic not publish or perish, but why in the world would the, would, would the advancement of knowledge require coercion? And, uh, that is, was the ideal place. And, yeah. uh, and uh, you are a research program in Stanford? Well, I, I started my program on, on modeling at Stanford. You see, I looked around and I couldn't figure out how is it that all our complex competencies and these complex social systems that we created, how could this all be produced by uh, sort of trial and error learning and rewarding and punishing? And, um, and just, just informal observation would show that a good part of human learning is based on, on social modeling. So I decided to, uh, 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 to uh, begin a program to try to understand what are the mechanisms by what you can learn by observation alone, where you aren't performing any responses or you aren't getting rewarded or punished, but rather through observation you uh, can, be, be, can begin again, at least learn the structure of the behavior. And uh, at that time, uh, you did uh, the, one of the most famous uh, experiments in psychology. Every, every textbook has, talks about the Boba doll. Boba so, doll. So you, Boba can, doll. <laughs> you have to tell something about the Boba doll. Oh, yes. Well, you see, I was doing, I was doing research on, on um, uh, different conditions of modeling. And um, it, was, it, was about, it, was, it was about this time when modeling became an important social issue because this was the, the advent of television where um, the, uh, the uh, television diffused very rapidly. And um, so families were sitting there uh, watching every form of, of uh, atrocity being um, modeled uh, in the comfort of their homes and there was growing concern about what effects this might have on, 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 their, on their children. And, um, and so I was, view, I was viewing the advent of television as foreshadowing a future in which the symbolic environment would become much more important than the, uh, than the immediate physical environment. And so I decided I'll add a uh, condition in the experiment where, um, where we um, uh, have the model uh, uh, presented as a as a as a uh, symbolic model, and uh, and at the, at the time there were uh, there was a belief that exposure to violence was cathartic that it would it would drain your aggressive mm -hmm. impulse and this would reduce your aggression. In the Bobadal experiment, we had we had a model exhibiting very unique forms of aggression uh, toward this huge boba doll, like hitting it with a mallet and a lot of verbal 
un unique verbal aggression. And, uh, and then we found very extensive modeling by uh, preschool children. And uh, um, the video, uh, the brief video illustrates the effect it had on, on, uh, on two children. And uh, now the, um, the Boba doll follows me wherever I go. Well, I was checking into a Washington hotel because you see virtually every student takes Psych 1 and, and there's the photographs of the Boba doll. So I check into a Washington hotel and a clerk looks down at the uh, registration card and he says, uh, didn't you do the Boba doll experiment? And I said, uh, I'm afraid that's going to be my legacy. And he says, no, no, that deserves an upgrade. <laughs> I'll, give you, <laughs> I'll give you an upgrade in a quiet part of the hotel. And uh, last month I'm checking through the Vancouver Customs and I hand my, my uh, passport to, uh, to the custom agents and she says, you might, you're the guy who did the Boba doll experiment, are you? <laughs> well, in reality, modeling was not only related, was not only important for research on aggression, but uh, uh, had a tremendous impact also on uh, treatment, clinical treatment, psychotherapy. Yeah, so. but see, before I get into that, I want to, uh, the, um, that research was addressing a, a, a much more fundamental problem. Oh. You see, our traditional theories of psychology were formulated before the revolutionary advance in technology, even before uh, television. Mm -hmm. And so all that research is pretty much oriented around um, direct experience in your immediate physical environment. Now, life in this electronic era totally transformed the, uh, transformed the environment. Mm -hmm. Namely, life in the cyber world has now transformed our idea of time, space, distance, so that these, these concepts have very different meaning now. Time doesn't mean anything. Space doesn't mean anything. Distance doesn't mean anything, nor do national borders anymore. And um, so, and, and with the speed, the, uh, the, the speed and the loci of influence have been greatly accelerated, mm -hmm. and with miniature devices, you can carry your symbolic environment with you, where, and you can you can pull it up whenever you want to, wherever you are. So these are these uh, revolutionary advances have totally uh, altered what we mean by the environment, and and psychology has to get in sync with this drastically changed uh, environment. And so, in a way, um, modeling lends itself very readily because so much of the, uh, the values, styles of behavior and, that are, uh, and attitudes that people have now are based on, on uh, global, even global modding, yeah. modeling. Yeah. And what led you to, to self-ethics, another uh, crucial construct that practically was uh, influenced immensely our discipline in many different fields from education, mm -hmm. clinic. Uh, well, that war. goes that goes through uh, um, another transformative change in society. Um, see, in the 60s, it became evident that our psychodynamic therapies were very weak. And within a decade, we had really transformed the field of psychotherapy from analyzing uh, your problems to a more action-oriented uh, treatment of how do you enable people to uh, begin to confront the problems and how do you enable them to develop effective ways of managing their life. And, um, and so there were, there was, we really were drastically changing the field. And so as part of that uh, work, um, I, um, uh, I was developing a guided mastery uh, treatment in which Mastery experience was the basic, uh, the basic way of, of helping people to uh, improve their lives and so on. And I uh, tested it uh, first with severe snake phobics. And uh, now um, their, their lives were completely impaired by this phobia and they were plagued with nightmares for 20, 30 years and so on. And, um, and so 
uh, phobics are not about to do what they dread. So we developed a uh, treatment here where we, we set it up with the mass rays that they couldn't fail despite themselves. And, um, and in fact, um, um, there's a uh, brief video that demonstrates what these, uh, what these um, uh, mass rays are. It was a powerful treatment. We could cure every snake phobic in four or five hours, regardless how severe or how long. And it not only cured the phobia, but um, it, it really wiped out um, uh, biological stress reactions. And the most striking effect to me was that it transformed uh, the people's uh, dream activity because they have been plagued with these reptiles for 20, 30 years. Four or five sessions of waking mastery experiences trans transformed their dream activity. So these reptiles suddenly began to take benign properties. And one, one woman came in uh, and said, you know, I had a dream yesterday. And I said, yes. And she said, I dreamt that a boa constrictor had befriended me and was helping me wash the dishes. So I figured she was cured. <laughs> but uh, uh, in, um, you already mentioned the, the, the enormous importance of uh, new communication technologies. And as a matter of fact, as I said in my introduction, uh, your work, your theory was at the right time to, to meet the opportunities of uh, the communication technologies to expand the possibility of psychology, of intervention in psychology in different fields. So I know that uh, your uh, uh, theory has been applied globally to deal with very severe problems, very important problems. So I think that you have to tell us about that. Yeah, Bobo has gone global. Yeah. Is my, yeah. um, one day uh, I received a telephone call from Miguel Sabido at, uh, he's a a uh, very distinguished playwright and producer of television in Mexico. He said, um, you know, I read your Bobadal experiment. I extracted about six principles from it, and I have created serial dramas to produce society-wide change. And uh, one is to increase the literacy rate in Mexico, and the second is to bring down the soaring, um, uh, soaring population growth. Now. We often have examples in the physical and the biological sciences of how research conducted for its own sake has had unanticipated uh, social benefits. In the case of the bubble doll experiment, here, here you had an experiment that was done 45 years ago. Uh, Miguel read about it, was able to develop these serial dramas to affect society-wide change. The, um, now, um, these are not fanciful stories. Um, uh, you model uh, people's everyday lives. You model the impediments they're struggling with. You help them um, adopt a vision of a better life. And then you inform them you enable them and you guide them to take the steps to, to realize that. And the other thing that has fantastic generality and power is that you can have multiple intersecting plot lines so that you can address virtually every issue in a society. For example, in one of, our, in one of the serial dramas in Mali in, in Africa, um, Child traffickers go to uh, poor families who have a lot of children, and they trick them into giving up some of their children with a promise that they will educate them and uh, send money home, and then they sell them for the uh, slave market uh, to in the uh, cocoa plantations. And they do that also with children who have been orphaned by parents who have died of AIDS. So, you know, we have about a 10-segment um, um, bit in our serial drama there in which we expose this. And the um, viewers now understand what's happening. They discuss it, and they take action to stop it. Um, another uh, brief example is 130 million women in Africa 
are subjected to the brutal genital uh, mutilation procedure. So in, in Somalia, where we had a, uh, a, a, one of the, op, the, uh, the serial dramas, we had uh, uh, some, uh, a segment on, uh, on, on, on this problem. So what we do is dramatize <clears throat> how a little girl to whom the uh, people are deeply bonded, we dramatize her going through, through the uh, uh, genital mutilation procedure and the uh, physical and psychological trauma. And then we have Muslim clerics uh, arguing that this procedure is not sanctioned by their religion. So before the serial drama, uh, the, um, uh, the, a majority of the of the uh, uh, people supported that procedure. After the drama, <clears throat> we had a switch to which into which they were um, dedicated to to abolishing it. So here we're really producing uh, society society wide change. Um, in uh, in Tanzania, we were. Um, uh, there we were using a, a, a radio uh, serial drama, and uh, and there were two broadcasting systems that had very overlap, so we were able to show it in in uh, half of Tanzania, and the other was control, and then we can uh, then later switch it, and um, and here again, um, the kind of problems that uh, we're addressing is. Um, um, how to promote uh, national literacy, how to raise the status of women <clears throat> in societies where uh, they're denied aspiration and they're denied their freedom and dignity. We are um, uh, helping families uh, in, in a planned childbearing so they can break the cycle of poverty and also enable women to uh, develop rather than just producing a lot of babies. And, um, and then we, um, um, uh, we have segments to try to curtail the spread of, of the AIDS epidemic. And then, uh, and then we have, uh, we have uh, se segments in which we're promoting uh, environmental conservation. Um, you see, we're, we're destroying um, much of the ecological supports of life that have evolved over eons to keep the planet cool and habitable. We have about 40 or 50 years to clean, our, clean up our act, and if we don't, we're going to have a planet that's hotter, more crowded, devoid of biodiversity, and uh, declining, declining uh, natural resources. So uh, a huge effort of these of of the serial drama is to. Um, but uh, in this case, uh, it's not only a matter of individual efficacy, but also of collective efficacy. That's another topic that you addressed. Well, yes, because when you're when you're working with society-wide change, yeah. you have to uh, enable people to believe that as a group they, 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 can, uh, they can effect change. And um, um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the AIDS one in Tanzania, uh, see in the dramas we also have, always have three models, a, uh, a, a positive model leading a pretty functional life, negative model, very dysfunctional, self-destructive life, and then a, ch and a transition model, one that starts negative and goes positive. So in Tanzania, AIDS is uh, transmitted heterosexually in these truck stops, and there are about 400 or 500 prostitutes. About two thirds of them are infected, and then uh, about a third of the truckers are infected. So we have, in the drama, we have three truckers. One is unprotected. It's clear that he's going to get infected, and then one who is cut back on partners and is. Uh, and is protected, and then we have the transitional one. So these two truckers try to get his buddy to begin to adopt uh, self-protective practices. He re refuses, and in the drama, um, he uh, contacts AIDS. And, um, and then we try to raise the status of, of women here, that women do not have to be victims of a, of, of a person who obviously would infect, infect them and so on. So, 
So we work on that as well. But you to develop a kind of uh, collective agency, that means uh, in order to be able to, to deal with problems that are quite at collective level, at community level, not only at individual. That's right, that because, that is, uh, because we also are dealing with how do you build the efficacy uh, and that's done uh, collectively, how to build the, uh, the uh, build and provide the support for the wife. The, uh, so in the, in the uh, broadcast region, uh, the national um, um, AIDS program there distributed 32 million condoms and in the control region, uh, 1 million. So these are, these are in, in our dramas in India, you know, we have an audience of 125 million, and we, we're dealing with, for a psychologist, so been, for a psychologist, that's a good very, number. <laughs> very busy over a, a variety of uh, topics, and uh, did it affect uh, your personal family life, or you take, was able to take a break sometime? That is also interesting. How do you make compatible science? Oh well, uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah, creativity you got, and uh, you, a kind you, of human life. Yeah, but you you got to take a break from the cerebral <laughs> stuff. Um, so, um, uh, particularly when I when I came uh, just when I came here, uh, I built my own furniture for the most part. Uh, I have a flourishing vegetable garden. And later on, I spent a lot of time playing with my grandchildren. And we have the benefit that we're uh, in close proximity to the noble grape. So we make sure we hit Napa Valley. I, uh, my wife and I love opera, so we always are sitting there in the, in the upper deck of the opera system. And still, you are very active. I know that you are working on a very important uh, book on moral disengagement. Uh, I think that uh, you should say has uh, something about you should anticipate uh, what is the major aim of the book uh, and is more relevant new contents in the book. So can you give us an example of uh, the kind of mechanism and the kind and the situation where these mechanisms are, are applied? Well, I think the best example, I have a chapter on it, is uh, moral disengagement of the death penalty. And uh, our research has uh, studied it at three levels. Um, at the public policy level, do you support the death penalty? And here, um, you, have, uh, you have great controversy, namely, um, um, you have moral justification by citing the Bible, the eye for an eye, the retribution argument. And then, and then um, for example, Pope John Paul said that, um, um, see, he opposed the death penalty. And those who were supporting said, that's a private view of his. He, he's not really reading the scripture right, so they're arguing about the morality. And so if you um, uh, assume that you have biblical support for it, there's no reason why you should have a moral problem. Um, then at the second level, at the jury level, people have to co condemn a person to death. And so what you do, you structure the um, the capital trial in such a way they'll be so able to do it. You structure in this way, but also you have to convince uh, people to do certain kind of jobs. So that means uh, imagine well, the person yeah, well, that is a... Uh, so you have the jury and um, they have the task of putting, a, of, of condemning a person to death. So how do they use moral disengagement to do that? Well, first of all, uh, if you're a strong supporter of death penalty, they, you don't serve on the jury, so they're always already coming with a bias. Secondly, they, they displace the responsibility for the decision to the sentencing uh, instruction, that they had no other choice according to the instruction except to sentence the person. Then another mechanism is... Um, um, there is no one being killed. They said, they said they don't, they don't kill them. They just sit on death row and get old. And then the big one is, 
our decision is just a trivial one because this is going to go through a whole bunch of uh, appellate review and uh, and we aren't making decisions. It's going to be way, made way down the line with a whole bunch of uh, judges. Uh, uh, so these, here you see them having a variety of mechanisms. So at the, at the uh, policy level you have moral sanction and then you have all these mechanisms. But then you have the executioners. Now, we've we've done the research on the on the public policy, um, uh, and Craig Haney does a did a beautiful research on the uh, jury, and then um, uh, we studied the executioners in three southern penitentiaries. They're the ones who have to do the killing. Now, first of all. They, um, they indicate that this is a society, society uh, um, mandate, namely society has, di has decided that this should be done, jurors have convicted this person, and, and they do it because it's a deterrent, and uh, that uh, executions deter others from, uh, from engaging in criminal offenses. Um, and, um, and so they take the position that our job is to do it as respectful as possible. And uh, they, they see them as professionals who, they aren't out there gung-ho, we want to execute someone. Then the only way you can get the, uh, them to, um, uh, to essentially kill the person is you have to use fantastic diffusion of responsibility. Namely, there's one person who gets the chemicals, there's another person who presses the buttons, there's another person who puts in the syringes, and, uh, and ironically, he's cleaning it up with a, a disinfectant so there isn't, <laughs> he's gonna, they're gonna kill this guy and they're out there to make sure he doesn't, he doesn't uh, um, have an infection, and uh, and then the strapped down team. There are about uh, a large number. One person straps down the left leg, the other the right leg, the other the uh, right hand, the torso, and so on. So no one really feels that there is an executioner. In fact, I include in the book a um, uh, a, a guard who had participa participated in 126 executions at San Quentin, and his job was to strap the left leg. And he said, I wasn't the executioner. So in order to, for a society to take a human life, they have to use this whole set of moral disengagements for them to be able to do that, because they have to live with themselves and they have to justify to themselves. But uh, the moral disengagement is much more diffuse than we expect, that we imagine there is uh, in any realm of life almost, or, or in any activity, in uh, economics, uh, in work organization, in health system. And um, can you bring us uh, some experience that, uh, for instance, in the broadcasting communication, how there is moral disengagement Engagement, moral disengagement can be used uh, in conveying communication, in conveying information. Well, that I have a very long chapter because it's personalized in ways. Um, I uh, uh, I was testifying before committees about the effects of uh, televised violence, and also to the uh, Federal Trade Committee when. Uh, there were ads on television in which were, dan were uh, dangerous to children. These were, th were these dune buggies in which, and also <laughs> they had one modeled on the Three Stooges in which you hit a person on the head with a mallet and then it was a Gassadrin headache, you see. And they would call me and they say, um, would your research suggest that we should take this thing off the air? And I said, yeah. And, uh, and so, um, uh, the networks uh, really mounted full, por uh, full court press. So if you're going to, that's your baptism into public policy. And I was an untenured uh, 
professor, and they sent out literature uh, saying that uh, my research was flawed. They, uh, CBS hired psychologists to, uh, to write uh, critiques of my research. Nefren, uh, who, who was the editor of uh, TV Guide, ran a whole series uh, of uh, essays uh, with titles such, um, Children Are Not Rats, <laughs> because if you run an experiment, you see that's rats. And then another one was titled, um, Man in the Eye of the Hurricane, that the Bandura School has taken over Washington and the Surgeon General is acting as though Rome is burning and Bandura is the fire extinguisher. Uh, then I get a call from one of my graduate students uh, who says, Al, you're on television. I said, no, I'm not. He said, you sure are. Apparently, they had put out a whole movie uh, uh, titled The Storyteller, in which they used all the eight mechanisms of moral disengagement. And so the plot line was a, uh, a writer who had written a script in which there was an arson, and then uh, some kid uh, modeled arson, and the child was, 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 um, uh, was killed that way. And so what they did is uh, the mother of the child who died, um, they had depicted her as the attacker because, um, uh, so you had, if I were to describe the whole series of verbal mechanisms, the, um, the, um, the writer visits his uh, daughter and, uh, and she is expressing concern about televised violence. And he said, yeah, but look at the stories you have here, Little Red Riding Hood and so on. And that was a standard argument that our classics, children's classics, are violent as hell. <clears throat> then, then they have, uh, so they have these kind of scenes. But the way I apparently uh, appear in there is they have a person representing a researcher who did the Bobo doll experiment, and he didn't come out looking very good at all. And um, so, um, so I go, I, you know, uh, Bob Sears, who was the chair, uh, calls me, and um, he says, uh, you know, Al, there, there's a lot of stuff in the public now, but you're you know, your research and the quality of your research and so on. And, uh, and so there's this Sabbath lull. And he said, uh, don't let the ex, don't let the ex wear you down. <laughs> and I won't use the word. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, I got very good support from, uh, from uh, Bob, but, uh, the message here, if you're going to get into public policy and you're going to take, a, this is the, uh, the assault that I'll get from my um, uh, moral disengagement book is going to be overwhelming because I essentially um, uh, cover every, every, uh, indus every industry and institution in our society as a pervasive problem of, of uh, moral disengagement. So I'm, this is where I have to find some small island <laughs> that cannot be found. But uh, fortunately, I, I don't have to worry about tenure. So, so I think that uh, we are at the end of our, of our interview, and uh, I, I thank you very much. Also well, I thank you very much for navigating me through this, uh, through this journey. Uh, I'd like to address the audience. It's not the miles traveled but the amount of tread that you still have left. And the last time I checked, I still had too much tread to uh, abandon this uh, fulfilling uh, journey. To you viewers, all good wishes to you as you navigate your life course agentically, and may the efficacy force be with you. Really, for me, it's been a great pleasure and an honor. So now we hit the noble grape. Now we can... <laughs> so I need a way to serve it. <laughs>